Yeah, what's cracking, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Prison Break Raw. I'm your host, the one and only Big JD. Finally got a chance to check out that movie, Tax Collector. And if you have not seen this movie, you don't have to go to the theater. If you got Amazon Prime, $6.99 will get you a rental for 24 hours. Go check it out. It's a pretty entertaining movie. Action-packed. I enjoyed it. I didn't walk away feeling that I wasted my $6 or 7 bucks. It had a lot of pretty intense scenes. The characters were pretty tight. I liked, I liked the whole movie overall. So because of one particular character that was in this movie, and we're going to talk all about him, a couple of people have asked me to do a review on this movie, being that it's specifically related to the kind of lifestyle that I've lived and, like I've mentioned, a particular character that's in this movie. So they've asked me to run a review on it. And I've never done movie reviews. I don't do movie, movie reviews. It's just not something I do on this channel. But, again, this movie is relevant to the kind of lifestyle I've lived. It's, it's relevant to the streets and, and, and everything that I've seen and been around for so long that I'm going to go ahead and take a crack at this. So watching the movie, and, and I got in a lot of the what people were trying to say, and I listened to a lot of the controversies and the bitching and whining that some people had to say. The first thing that I did is I went out onto YouTube to look to see if there was any other channels talking about this movie. Didn't really see anything related to it, but I did come across the movie critics channel called Double Roasted. A couple of black dudes that had really no idea what the fuck they were talking about in relation to this movie or the specifics of it, but they were just running a movie review, but straight ass clown jack wagons, focusing on the hot topics of race. Made it all about race, all about race. You know, the typical soy-ish, neck beard, leftist white dudes and women, they like to bitch and complain and talk about cultural appropriations. And uh, Shia LaBeouf, who played Creeper in this movie, was accused of appropriating Chicano or Mexican culture for his character of Creeper, but yet he played Creeper, who was a white Sureño, was a white homie, as if this never happens. You know, and that's always been the thing. Why is it that so many people have such an issue, such an issue with white dudes that are from Chicano street gangs, Sureños, Norteños, whatever they may be, why is this such a thing? Why is it such an issue? I don't get it. I mean, that was the biggest criticism, and people were talking about even preventing this movie from hitting the theaters, protesting it, and doing all these things because of this evil appropriation that was going on from Shia LaBeouf. Stupid, man. I mean, he was no different than the guy, uh, Christian Bell, who played Jim in Harsh Times. He's a white dude that grew up in the barrio. As if that never happens, like I said. And as, as I mentioned that, like, people were tripping on me when I came out, like, oh, this white Sereno. And other such prison channels in the beginning, like, well, I just can't understand. I can't wrap my brain around it. How does this happen? You can't wrap your brain around it because you ain't from those streets. You ain't from that culture. You ain't from that part of the world. So you're never going to really understand it. But this shit goes all the way back to the 1930s. Man, this shit goes all the way back to the 1800s, certain groups of banditos, the, the people that ran around with like Zapata or even Pancho Villa, they had white dudes running around with them, banditos. It's been going on a long time. European and, and, and specifically Mexican culture in a lot of ways is very intertwined. I mean, even in, in most of the musical instruments, a lot of the musical instruments and in a lot of them bands are, are, are German instruments from like polka bands and shit like that. I mean, the culture is, is the same in a lot of ways. You could take an Irish family in the boroughs of, like, New York back in the days or in, in, in some of the tough areas of, of Boston, and their families are almost exactly the same as Mexican families. Like, you ever seen the movie The Fighter with Mark Wahlberg? How all his sisters loaded up in that car with the mom to go down there and beat the dude's old lady up? I mean, it's the culture is the same in a lot of ways. So there's always been... Like a poor white family, whether it had been a Jewish family, an Irish family, and in the case of, of the big homie Joe Morgan, Lithuanian and English family that lives in some of these neighborhoods of like Maravilla or East L.A., Boyle Heights, 
that grew up exposed to that culture all the way back since the Zoot Suit days. Even in the movie Zoot Suit, there was a white dude that was in there that played a white Zoot Suiter. The guy that was the leader of the pharaohs in that movie American Graffiti was a part of a Chicano and white lowrider club. You even got the dude from Colors. You've been talking a bear too long, eh? I mean, this has been going on a long time. And then here comes Shia LaBeouf who's playing Creeper, and now all of a sudden, here comes the Social Justice Brigade to start screaming cultural appropriation, and the man was playing a white dude for the movie. Come to peace with it. It happens. I mean, Lord forbid there's actually a solid, tough white dude in the gangster world. I mean, the way Hollywood and these people try to blast him in the social justice left is that all white dudes are a bunch of stumbling, bumbling buffoons. It ain't got no rhythm. It ain't cool. I've talked about this before in relation to a specific role model for a lot of these young white males because they feel marginalized in these ways. Do you doubt it? Do you think that I'm wrong for this? Do you think that I'm off? Well, let me give you the biggest hypocrisy of this whole thing, and you be the judge of it. The guy that played the big homie in the back, you know, the guy that was Bobby Soto, the guy who played David Aguevez, his father, was Jimmy Smits. Jimmy Smits. Do you know who Jimmy Smits is? Jimmy Smits is half Puerto Rican and half Dutch. Well, his father was of Dutch descent who grew up in South America. So Jimmy Smits is basically half white, half Puerto Rican. And yet nobody said a word, a word about him playing the leader of a particular organization. And they didn't name the organization in this movie. But you know who they are. You know what I'm saying? You know who they are. So a Puerto Rican, half Puerto Rican, half Dutch guy from New York played the leader of, you guessed it. But then the critics and the rebuttalists come back with, oh, well, you know, Jimmy Smith is Latino. Yeah, Puerto Rican. So you're trying to say that Puerto Rican culture and Mexican is the same? It's night and day, two totally different cultures. It'd be like you saying or me saying Jamaicans and Nigerians are the same or Chinese and Japanese are the same or Filipinos and Hawaiians are exactly the same. They're not. They're totally different cultures. The only thing that the Puerto Ricans and the Mexicans share is Spanish. That's it. Culturally, they're completely different. So that right there is a stupid argument. But yeah, they said nothing about Jimmy Smith's, and that just goes to prove to you everything that I say. So double penetration or double roasted or whatever they are, they were, they were you know, making a lot of fun of this movie, laughing about Shia's use of Spanish or Spanglish and saying that he was butchering it horribly. They even pulled up a clip where he's walking up to the apartments and, and Shia's like, what's up, homie? And they're like, hoo, 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 laughing and giggling like, oh, that was horrible. There's a lot of white homies like that, man. I'm guilty of, of charged of doing that myself. I butcher Spanish all the time. And I'll tell you why that is. Just because we grow up in the environment, just because we run in the streets with the homies, that don't mean that anybody in our household, our parents, a lot of them don't have Spanish as a second language. Nobody in the household speaks like well, Spanglish or even speaks with that kind of an accent. So however you were raised in your household, you're going to have that as part of your makeup, and you're going to have your environment with it as well. Yes, I've met a lot of white dudes that were able to mimic very well the whole slang and the, and the lingo and, and the accent quite well, but I've always learned that a lot of those dudes that did that usually got laughed at a lot more than the guy that was just being himself. You could sort of hear it in some of the things that he says, but some of the other things that he says, you you know, it's, it's, it's very white. But that's the way it is, man. I mean, just by the reasons that I explained it to you. So it's, it's really kind of stupid to use those as points to try to ridicule this movie. And then they were all, also talking about everywhere they go, they were taking tequila shots. How, te- how cliche is that? Well, duh. Anywhere I've ever been in a house party, quinceanera, club, whatever, me and the homies, we taking shots of tequila. I mean, how many times have you been in the video and you're sitting around looking at a bunch of homies sipping dry martinis? I mean, let's just keep it all the way real. Tequila is, is there. It's, it's, it's a part of it, man. Whether it's a cliche or not, it doesn't matter. These are the criticisms of the movie. Criticizing all these little race-type things, but yet nobody was looking at how realistic was it 
as opposed to the real shit that goes on in the streets. So Bobby Soto played David. Shia LaBeouf played Creeper. They were homies, obviously from the same neighborhood. They've been putting in a lot of work. And if you look at the character of Creeper himself, the one thing you'll notice is his ears were completely cauliflowered. That right there was to show just how hard it was for him to earn his, his place in that society, to earn his keep and to be respected through his level of violence and constantly being up in the mix. That's what those ears were all about. Some people didn't even notice that he had cauliflower ears for that movie. So <clears throat> there's that. The one that really, like, the minute they went to the auto shop, and it was George Lopez who was the big homies contact on the streets. I was about ready to be like, ah, oh, man, George Lopez. But he did a play, he did a pretty good um, character of, of, of David's uncle in this, in this movie. And, you know, it was, it was always kind of like a mystery of who the big homie in the back was that was on the phone laughing at him. But you find out later it was, da you know, spo spoiler, it was David's father, Jimmy Smith, you know, the Puerto Rican guy that, didn't get accused of cultural appropriation, but Shia did. Yeah, that guy. So there was parts in this movie that were realistic as far as, like, collecting the taxes, pay, you know, picking up that one-third for the big homies. Whatever it is that you make, you got to kick over that. But in the movie, it was 30%. But I've always heard it at one-third. But whatever. Don't really know how realistic it is as far as the amount of money they were getting at every one given time, like carrying around bags and bags of it. It's quite possible. I mean, I was never a tax collector myself, but I can't really confirm nor deny if that really happens, but probably does. In slang and dope, a lot of people make a lot of quick cash. So that right there, I can, I can find believable. But the one part that really was just like I started shaking my head at in this movie was when it went to the apartments, when they were called over there to the apartments to do a side job, and they had a black dude tied up to a chair. He was all beat up. He was a blood. He's a member of the Pueblo Bishops. So the minute David came in, he's like, what the fuck are you doing? We don't want these kind of problems and all that. I don't really know if that would be the whole get down or the conversation. But you start to learn a little later on why David or Bobby Soto was so concerned about this particular dude from Pueblo Bishops, why he was tied up to the chair, because he had some history with the fool that was running the, the bishops, the Pueblos, in uh, Clee Sloan. The guy, you've seen him before. He played the leader over there in the, in, in, in the jungles in fucking uh, Training Day. Or he was also in that movie, End of Watch. So he's, he's, he's been around. And apparently Bobby Soto or David Cuevas had a relationship, some kind of a level of respect or history with the fool that played the leader of Pueblos. So he was going to return this dude back to that guy's neighborhood. Personally, I think the homies would have domed them, chopped them up, and got rid of them. But then again, you know, you got Hollywood trying to bring this, bring this, you know, kind of like unity back to black and brown and the, and the struggles and the, the division they have in Los Angeles. So you could sort of see the political, you know, optics for this one right there for that. And, and I think that's really what it was all about, because if they would have killed him, it would have just changed the whole course of the movie, as you're going to see. So they're going around, and they're collecting their taxes. Come to find out they're $20,000 short. So they got to go back and stick the gun in the fool's mouth, and you got Shia LaBeouf Creeper. He's like, I want this. I want this, homie. It was, it was a pretty cool scene, you know what I mean? But those jackasses on double penetration were, were making fun of that. Like I said, just because he's a white dude is the only reason why they were making fun of that. Um, and and that, that kind of shit really happens, man, as far as like somebody being short on what they're supposed to kick upstairs and then motherfuckers got to go back and handle their business. It happens like that. But as they were running around the streets trying to get more money again, they came across a neighborhood that you're probably familiar with if you're in the know about a lot of these movies like Training Day was in the neighborhood hillside where they put the fool in the bathtub for Alonzo. Alonzo paid him to kill him. Well, they're going back to see that neighborhood only. It's not the same people. The fool that was running that neighborhood looked like a bison to me. They show up to pick up 200000 is what they were supposed to get. 
But the minute they got there, they knew something was wrong because you have fools with cowboy hats sitting up on the roofs of rifles. And honestly, I don't know how somebody's going to be sitting up on a rooftop with a fully automatic assault rifle in Los Angeles, cops driving around all over the place. Maybe nowadays, but in the setting of this movie, don't see how that's realistic. So they go in there, and you already know some shit's going to happen. So then here comes Corneo. The rapper Corneo comes in to play the main villain of this whole deal. Now, this is the part that's unrealistic to me, the whole character of Corneo, because some people were saying he was trying to, like, portray the cartel guy that's coming to take over Los Angeles to, you know, push the big homies out, to push all these, you know, all the Chicanos out. It's going to be like a Mexicano thing. It's going to be a cartel thing. But if you really listen to a lot of the things that, that they were saying to Corneo and they were saying about him, you have to sort of wonder if maybe he was sort of trying to portray a dropout. You feel me on this one? Now follow with me on this, okay? Trying to portray a dropout. Listen to some of the things that they were saying about him. Okay, they're saying that they had a hit put out on him. They're saying that he fled, that he, he basically got banged out of everything, that he was, what it sounded like to me, like he was a big homie, right? But he had a hit put out on him. He, he fell out of favors. He got banged off the yard. Sort of almost sounds like maybe he ended up on an s and and then ran to Mexico to get away from it all was down there for several plus years and came back like, I'm taking over. Okay, now they're trying to portray him as that he's a leader of a cartel. I don't know of any cartel that's going to take a, a dude who was a big homie, who was a dropout, who had a hit on him, who was from a Chicano street gang, and he's going to take over a cartel in Mexico just because he just shows up. Regardless of how crazy, how dangerous he is, they got Sicarios down there that are way more vicious than that. I would think that if that's where they, he went and they knew he was there, that they would have gotten with somebody in the cartel to hold on to him so they can send somebody down there to whack his ass. But how he ends up coming back as a leader of the cartel, I sort of almost looked at it as like he was a, a two-fiver or an S&Y dude, and he was trying to portray this whole new flux, this whole new shift, just with some of the language he was using as far as there's a shift, the old way is done. The old guard is out. These old fools are gone. These are a lot of the words that a lot of them people in these S and Y gangs use. So it almost made me think somebody that's actually in the know, somebody that's used to hearing this shit in the streets or in the system or whatnot, didn't really sound like how the cartel talks and it didn't operate like how the cartel operates because the cartel is not going to try to come in there and push out the big homies because it's a mutual agreement and understanding on a business level to keep all of their pushers and their product and everything safe because let's face it you got over 50,000 gang members Sureños, that are in Los Angeles alone not counting Orange County IE San Diego everywhere else so to basically say that they're coming in and pushing all of them out I don't see how business people would be wanting to do that most of the time characters like that all they want to do is just keep the flow going and keep the peace the best they can and pay off whoever they have to pay off in order to assure that the money keeps going. So to me, it almost seemed like Oneo was portrayed as kind of like a dropout coming to get revenge sort of thing for me. So that's what really made it kind of unrealistic because you got to know that any of these S&Y organizations aren't going to make a huge splash like that, and they're not going to have former Marines and, and Sicarios and all these things at their disposal to do that. I mean, usually when they get out, they really ain't making no noise except for maybe knocking off a couple of nickel and dime type dealers here and there or talking real loud on social media or talking some shit somewhere else but never really, like, going after anything to try to push it out or rub it out or flip it to the new generation, to the future. Just my thoughts on all that. But this movie in itself was a good movie. But you have to take it with a grain of salt. It's Hollywood. So it's going to have a Hollywood flavor. A lot of the things were unrealistic. And as you get further into this movie, like I told you, David, Bobby Soto, and his relationship with Cleese Sloan, the, the leader of the Pueblos, finally gets revealed for what the whole purpose was for that little exchange of him calling him a candle in the dark and all that shit. When his, all his homies were killed and, and poor Creeper... 
was um, faced with the fate of getting a crocodile boot smashed into his face till his head exploded. And all of the other soldados and everything that were at his were all were killed. Uh, Bobby Soto's family, his wife was killed and, and children were kidnapped by Coneo. Um, he goes to the Pueblos for help. Now, this is the part that's kind of unrealistic, but yet at the same time, what a lot of people don't understand is that a lot of blood neighborhoods, homies like Chicanos from like Barrios and stuff, have always never really had, have had less of a problem with blood neighborhoods than they have with Crips. I guess it's because Crips are always more numerous. From what I've seen, I've seen homies get along better with Bloods than they do with Crips. <clears throat> but, again, like I said, <clears throat> this right here is where it would kind of like I would draw the line on all that. I wouldn't see no homie who's, it comes out later that Jimmy Smith's, the big homie, is actually Bobby Soto's dad. I don't see a dude who's like the crown prince of the big homies to be going to a black blood gang for help when you got 50,000 foot soldiers in the city, in the county, all around you. But, you know, that's, again, that's Hollywood bringing that black and brown divide together. And they did so, and it ended where both men came out successfully killing Goneo and living happily ever after. Well, maybe not so happily ever after because the dude lost his wife. But a lot of fiction in this movie when it comes to things like that. But overall... The way they used a lot of the lingo, the way they portrayed a lot of different people and stuff was pretty on point. Whoever the producer is, this guy, he was his name, Steyer. He's done his homework. I mean, but he has experience with working with, like, Harsh Times and Training Day, End of Watch, and all this stuff like that. He's been around all these different movies. But the general gist of it is is it's Hollywood. To me, it's, it's just Hollywood, but... It was an entertaining movie. Don't really understand all the controversy about Shia LaBeouf, to be honest with you. But then again, that's just these neckbeard soyish people that just need to bitch about all things European male. Just my opinion, and it's the reason why I talk about that, because I've actually been in that. For anybody to come at me and tell me I'm culturally appropriate anything, I'm going to tell them to go fuck themselves with a 10-foot pole. It's just what I'm going to do, because... That's not what it is. And any of my homies would probably be smashing on some fools that said that shit right along with me. But yeah, man, the critics are wrong about this. Everybody's wrong to point the controversy. It's a movie. These are characters. But the kind of person that Shia, Shia played, Creeper, there's, them dudes are quite numerous in the system. Like I told you, I pointed out two big homies, and they're up there. They're up there. So you already know what it is, and you heard it right here. Prison break roll, uncut, uncensored, no holds barred, not sugar code, not politically correct, all up in your face, slapping you with that dick of reality, and I'm out.